here to be with you because we just finished, as of yesterday, actually, actually technically this morning, I didn't do the airport drop-offs, Whitney and Ethan did, so I don't have to deal with that, but as of this morning at 1 o'clock in the morning, we are completely finished with all of our Hope Youth Corps throughout the whole summer. So it's been a wild, crazy, ridiculous, and ridiculously awesome summer. Uh, I'll have to add the awesome part because it has been great. Uh, but we did, I mean, if we be go back all the way to May, we did a men's retreat followed by six straight weeks of three Hope Youth Corps programs with a two-week break, and then a big singles retreat, and then a week break, and the last Hope Youth Corps. And now my summer is pretty much done. <laughs> pretty much done. It's, it's almost there. And so, like I said, I am super happy to be here with all of you this morning, to be able to share God's word, just to realize that I'm actually going to be here in this city for most of my life um, for the next several, sometimes, I don't, I don't know. Well, that, that's all subject to change, but at least for as my, my foreseeable future, I'm going to be here in Anchorage for a while, which is really good, and I'm happy about that. But even more exciting than all of these things, we have a very exciting thing happening today. We've got a baptism. Pretty fired up. We've got Michelle Crowell getting baptized into Christ this morning, so that's very, very exciting. You know, we're, we're doing really great. We had, we had Reese last week, and then we had, um, ah, I can't remember your name. Marcy, that's it, yes. Marcy, I wanted to say Tracy for some reason. Marcy, so we've got three weeks, three baptisms. It's been a good three weeks, guys. It's pretty awesome. That's good stuff. So, hopefully you're looking forward to settling into a nice fall. I know I'm looking forward to settling into a nice fall, but today and this morning we're going to continue our trek and our journey through the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to find ourselves in Mark chapter 12 this morning. And so, as we've talked about on a number of occasions throughout our telling of our preaching through this Gospel, this, this Gospel of Mark has been very much the action-oriented Gospel, focused very much on a lot of what Jesus did and what He came to do, and relative to the other Gospels, not as much focused on what Jesus said. Now, as we enter into Mark 12, we're going to flip the script, because Mark chapter 12 is almost entirely about Jesus and what He said. Because as we go into Mark chapter 12, if you remember Mark chapter 11, uh, Jesus had come back into Jerusalem, and this is kind of at the end, the end of things almost, before he gets arrested and crucified and those things. But the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, all the leaders in Israel, feeling increasingly threatened by this guy Jesus, are upping the ante more and more and more, trying to trap him in his words, trying to get him to slip up, trying to get him to fall, trying to get him to do something wrong. And so this Mark chapter 12, this chapter is all about these people trying to trap Jesus. And so if you've been with us and you remember Mark chapter 10 and you remember Mark chapter 11, you we're going to see a lot of the same things in Mark chapter 12. We're going to see Jesus using the strategies that we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks to answer these people as they try to trap him. And so I hope you remember a little bit about us talking about how we can respond well not fight and not fall into the battle, not actually get into those arguments and those debates and learn to respond well when people want to challenge our faith. Because again, like I said, we're going to see these more and more and more. But as we go through these particular challenges that Jesus faces in Mark 12, I really want you to focus on A, how Jesus addresses the question. He deals with the question, even if it's just the surface part of the question, but then he always takes it deeper. He always gets to the heart. He gets to the root, what's behind the question, to address the heart. So let's go ahead and dive in. Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 1. It says, Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At the harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. 
But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest Jesus, to arrest him, because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. Now, to understand this parable a little bit more, we've got to remember a little bit of the tail end of Mark 11. And if you remember the tail end of Mark 11, it's when the chief priests, the elders, the teachers of the law, they're asking Jesus by what authority he was doing the things that he did. And then, as we talked about last week, Jesus flipped the tables on them and asked them a question about John the Baptist and said, well, if you don't have an answer to my question, I'm not going to give you an answer about the authority by which I do these things. So that was the tail end of Mark chapter 11, but then he launches in Mark chapter 12 into this parable. And what he does by telling this parable is he in fact does reveal what, by what authority he does the things that he has been doing. He makes it very clear, very evident that yes, he does claim to be the Christ. He does claim to be the Son of God. And he also is predicting what is to come, his eventual death on the cross. And after hearing this parable, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elders, they're even more upset. They're even more angry with him, and they're even more motivated to try to arrest him, to try to figure out how they could trap him. Why? Why were they so upset? Well, not only were they really upset about Jesus' claims, not, really, not only were they really upset about the fact that Jesus just laid out very clearly that, hey, I am the Son of God, hey, I am the Christ, and yes, I do have the authority to do this, and yes, I am going to continue to do these things no matter how much you dislike it. That was upsetting to them. But even more upsetting to them was the fact that he called them out in this parable. He was calling them out on the things that they were doing. So how is this parable spoken against them? Well, the vineyard, the, the picture, the word picture of the vineyard was always used as a metaphor for God's people, for the people of Israel. And with that in mind, you can see, or you can, you can think about the farmers here in this parable, they were the ones that were supposed to take care of the vineyard, to make sure it grew, to make sure that it produced fruit, to make sure that it remained healthy and strong. And so essentially this parable was spoken to with, and with the teachers of the law, the elders, the chief priests in mind, because they were the ones that were responsible, they were entrusted with taking care of God's people. That's how they saw themselves. They saw themselves as the high and mighty ones that were the, the most spiritual ones that were supposed to be taking care of God's people. And so Jesus was speaking this parable against them, basically telling them that they've done a very, very, very poor job of taking care of the vineyard. They've done a very poor job of making sure that the, the vineyard is producing fruit, that it was going after that, that they were doing that. But instead, yeah, instead of responding and listening to the message that God the owner sent to them, all of the messengers, they instead ignored them. They instead chose to beat, kill, send away empty-handed all of the servants that God had sent. So what is he talking about? The prophets throughout the Old Testament, John the Baptist in the New Testament, and Jesus himself. God had sent so many people to these people to try to help them, to try to motivate them, to try to get them back on the right track, but they wouldn't budge. They wanted to continue to do the things that they wanted to do. And in fact, instead of listening, they had those people killed. They had those people beaten. John the Baptist was beheaded. And they were, even as Jesus was speaking this parable, they were trying to plot, on, plot how to kill him. And so, in this parable, Jesus was revealing their true motives. And they didn't like it, because they knew that those motives were bad. How do you respond when someone reveals your true motives? How do you respond when someone calls you out on your true motives? How do you handle it when the vineyard owner sends his messengers and his servants to you? 
to call you higher in the faith. To call you to challenge you on the things that you're doing. To try to challenge you to do better in your relationship with God. To challenge you to make sure that you're helping God's vineyard grow. Are you willing to consider what they're willing to say? Are you willing to consider what they bring to you, the challenges that they call you to? Or do you just get defensive? Do you just try to fight back? Are you one of those individuals that gets super defensive? Like, well, you can't judge me. You can't do that. Only Jesus can judge me. Nobody else can tell me those things because Jesus is the one. that I, I just read the scriptures. I don't need to listen to you. Or are you the counterattacker, right? The, the one that says, well... But you have that other struggle that is totally unrelated to the things that we're talking about right now, but let's talk about you. Let's talk about the things that you aren't very good at because you aren't a very good person, are you? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> right? It's so easy, isn't it? It's so easy to react defensively when people challenge us, when people call us higher, when people are trying to actually help us do better in our relationship with God. But the reality is we're all prideful. We all hate to be in the wrong and we don't want to be corrected. We don't want to be told that we're doing something wrong. We want to be told that we're doing something right all the time. And when we're told that we're not doing it as well as we could, it's too easy to be defensive. Too easy not to respond well. Like the teachers of the law here. Like the chief priests here. So how do you respond? It's an important question. Because the reality is, is we all desperately, desperately need those types of people in our lives. We all desperately need people in our lives that are willing to call us higher. Desperately need people in our lives that are willing to correct us. Willing to, willing to put us on the right track. Why? Well, the reality is for us is that if you call yourself a Christian, just like the chief priests, the elders, the teachers of the law had a responsibility to take, to take care of the vineyard, to take care of God's people, if you call yourself a Christian, so do you have a very real responsibility to take care of God's people. To make sure that the vineyard is growing. To make sure that the vineyard is producing fruit. That is each and every one of our responsibilities. That's what we need to do. If we call ourselves Christians, it's part of the job description. We're all workers in the vineyard. See, Jesus, when Jesus came, he kind of blew up that whole clarity, the clergy lady system that said that just a very tiny group of elite people was responsible for leading the church. No, that's not how it works now. Each and every one of you have a role. Each and every one of you have a responsibility to lead God's people, to help move God's kingdom in the right direction, to make sure that it is doing and bringing the most glory to God that is possible. Each one of you have a responsibility. Do you own it? Do you own your responsibility? We've got to. We've got to own that responsibility. We've got to do something with it. And you know what helps? You know what helps us to stay on the right track? Outside input. Outside input, outside perspective from people that can see, that know us, that can help us, that can see our faults, that can see our flaws, and are willing to have the conversations with us to call us higher. How do you respond to them? How do you respond to those messengers? Because here's the reality again. If, if you have people that come to you that honestly want to help you, so they call you out, but you respond defensively, you get in an argument, you get in a fight, you know what they're going to do? They're going to say, well, this is not worth it. This is not worth my energy to try to fight with you about something. I'm just trying to help you. And so what they're going to do is they're going to say, well, I'm not going to do that again. One by one, more and more people that are going to try to help you, you're going to blow up in their face. And then one day you're going to walk around and realize that you've got no one. No one to help you, no one to challenge you, no one to help you grow in your relationship with God. And I know that's not what we want. We all want that accountability because we all want to be able to do great things for God, but it requires us to have a humble response. And so what's your response? Do you respond like the chief priests? Do you respond like the elders? Or do you have a soft heart and are you willing to change? It's such an important question. Let's keep reading here as the next group tries to outsmart Jesus here. Mark 12, 13 now. It says, Later they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to, to Jesus to catch him in his words. They, said, they came to him and said, Teacher, 
We know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and, and he asked them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. So here, in this particular, we have, we have two new people. So we first had the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now we have two new groups of people, the Herodians and the Pharisees, which actually don't get along at all, except when they're trying to plot to trap Jesus together. They're now trying to get on Jesus' case here. And you can, almost, you can almost feel their kind of slimy smugness as they approach Jesus with this question, because they, they think they've got him caught. Because at this time... The, the imperial tax was, it was a really sticky, sensitive issue for the Jews. Because the Romans had come and occupied the Jews and then forced them to pay this tax. So it wasn't as though this was a tax that was voted in. It wasn't a like, oh, okay, well, let's just take a vote. And if it's popular enough, then we'll tax it. No, this was the Romans saying, you're going to pay us so that we can fund our oppression of you, essentially. <laughs> That's essentially what was going on. So they were really, 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 really not happy about this tax. And so, these Pharisees and Herodians thought they had a really neat trap. Because if Jesus said, no, don't pay the taxes, it's wrong to pay the taxes, well then, then the, the Jews could go to the Romans and say, well see, this guy's a revolutionary, he's trying to usurp the Roman government, you should kill him, you should take care of him. Right? So if Jesus said, paying taxes is wrong, he's in trouble. But if Jesus said, yes, absolutely, you need to pay your taxes, then what would have happened? Well, he would have lost a lot of popular support because nobody liked this tax. And, and also, you had to consider the fact that the tax was going to the Caesar who claimed to be Lord of their lives and claimed to be divine. Right? So then, in that way, they would, they would call Jesus out on, on denying the sovereignty of God. And so there's nothing that Jesus could have said, yes or no, that would have given him the right answer. So how does he respond? Well, he asks a question. Right? We talked about this a couple weeks ago. He asks a question. He sets his own trap for them. Whose coin is this? Whose face is on this? Whose inscription? Caesar's. Well then, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. So what's the heart of the issue here? What's, what, what is Jesus getting at here? Whether you like it or not, as Christians, we have a duty to abide by our government. There it is. Plain and simple. We have a Christian duty to be not only law-abiding citizens, but some of the most outstanding, upright citizens of the governmental authorities that we have in place. We should be great citizens. We should be, we should be the ones that, yes, we should be paying our taxes. Yes, we should be contributing. We should be contributing, co contributing members of our society under the government that we have. And you know what? It doesn't matter if you like the laws that are in place. So long as that they don't contradict God's word, follow them. It doesn't matter if you like them. It doesn't matter if you agree with them at a personal level. Follow them. Because that is what the heart of a Christian is supposed to do, to live and submit to the authorities that have been put into place. That's the heart of that. So yeah, it is right to pay the taxes. Yeah, it is right to follow the laws of the land, even if you don't like that. Because here's the thing. Jesus, again, just proves once again that he was not going to be this warrior king that was going to come and overthrow the Romans and set, Jews, set the Jews back up at the top of the totem pole. That's not what he came to do. He didn't come to conquer the Roman government. He came to conquer people's hearts. That's what he came to do. He didn't come to change the laws of the land. He came to change people's hearts. And so there's another entire, an entire another lesson in that. Right? If you want to change the system, you have to change the people. And that's what Jesus was coming to do. He wanted to change people. He wanted to work through people to help them have a relationship with God, to help them change the system, to help them 
change the world. How about you? What are you here for? It's easy, right, to, regarding this government stuff, it's easy to voice our, all, all of our opinions and have all of our platforms and our primaries and our everything else. But how are you changing people? How are you changing you? And how are you allowing God to work through you to change others? Because that's the heart. That's what Jesus was going after here. A very important concept. So, obviously, Jesus is way smarter than these people. And he continues to be way smarter than these people. And so, obviously, they're going to be like, wow, he's way smarter than us. Let's just give up, right? Let's just not do this. No, that's absolutely not what happened. So now we've got another group. So we're going like the whole gamut of religious leaders here. We've had the chief priests. We had the teachers of the law. We had the elders. Now we had the Pharisees and the Herodians. And now the Sadducees are going to give themselves a shot here to try to get under Jesus' skin. So we'll continue. Mark chapter 12, 18 now. It says, Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves him a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but also died, leaving no child. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures of the power of God? When the dead rise, they will, neither marry, be, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, the account, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. So first of all, this is a totally ridiculous question. Like, this is, this is just a stupid question. And the goal of the Sadducees here was to try to debunk the resurrection. That's what they were trying to get at. They were trying to make the resurrection look like a crazy, wacky, out there doctrine that has no basis in reality. That's, what, that's, that's the root. That's what they were really going after. But on the surface, it was a question about marriage in heaven. But obviously it goes much deeper than that. Because they were trying to make this mockery of the resurrection. They believed that when the body died, the soul died, it was done, it was over. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And they got this idea from the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible. They believed that the Pentateuch was the only inspired scripture. And the Pentateuch does not explicitly reference the resurrection. And so they decided to say, well, the resurrection totally doesn't exist, and therefore we don't believe in it, in it at all. So, notice here how Jesus responds to this question. What he does first is he responds to, well, no, he says something really interesting first. He says, you guys basically have no idea what you're talking about at all. You don't know the scriptures, you misinterpret them, and you don't know the power of God. So really you have no basis in truth of anything. You just don't get it. So that's how he opens and then he addresses the question itself, right? The marriage question, okay? And the short answer to the marriage question is stop pretending like heaven is going to be like a better earth. That's, that's it. There's no, the, we, we sometimes think that heaven is just going to be everything that we're used to but just enhanced and better. And so things like marriage are going to be there and all the relationships we're going to be there with all of our super friends and we're going to be just like here but better. That's just, it's not that, that's not how heaven goes. That, that's basically what Jesus is saying there. There's no need for marriage in heaven for whatever reason. I don't know. I've not been there yet. So there you go. So that, that's the surface issue. But what's, what's the root here, the, this resurrection issue? Well, he attacks that too, right? Because he goes and he uses a scripture from the Pentateuch to prove the resurrection. See, what the Sadducees had done is that they had latched on to this conviction, latched on to this doctrine, and then said all these things. Well, there's no scripture to support this thing, so obviously it's not true. But they got so latched into it that they ignored the scriptures that actually referenced it. They ignored the scriptures that actually disagreed with their belief. How easy is that? How easy is that for each and every one of us today? Because I don't care whether you think so or not, you lean a certain way. 
You look at the scriptures a certain way and you lean on a certain spectrum of reading those scriptures. And you like a certain set of scriptures and you don't like another set. That's the way it goes, right? But our challenge for us always is how do we present the whole gospel? How do we present and how do we apply all of the gospel? How do we make sure that we're not misinterpreting or misrepresenting the scripture by presenting all of it and not just the stuff that we like, not just the convictions that we hold dear to us. For me, this is really tough because if, if, if you've heard me preach before, I am a really big into, I'm really, really big into doing. I'm all about do. Like, it's a, a make sure that your words match up with what you do. Make sure that you're putting your faith into practice. I just spent eight weeks with a bunch of teenagers in the middle of Talkeetna to teach them how to do their faith. And almost to the point of saying all that talk is useless. Almost to the point. And so I focus so much on do. You need to do. You need to have action. You need to have evidence. You need to demonstrate these things. But... What I can do when I get so focused on that is I can miss a whole other side of the gospel. Grace, right? The fact that actually you can't do anything, <laughs> right? You can't do anything to earn your salvation. There is, if God did not send down Jesus and if Jesus did not die on the cross for my sins to offer me this grace, there is no amount of doing anything ever that could save me. But you know what? I don't like that. I don't like that side of the scriptures because I like to do and I want to preach to you that you need to do. And so what can I do? Well, I can misrepresent God. I can misinterpret the Bible because of my lean, my tilt. What about you? What about your convictions that you hold dear? What are the scriptures that you focus on and ignore the ones that offer a counterpoint? Or ignore the ones that even totally disagree with what you believe. It's too easy. It's too easy. Just to focus on the ones that we want. So how do you not do that? Well, you read the Bible and you actually present the whole gospel. You have to get into it. You have to dig through it. When's the last time you've actually looked for evidence counter to what you believe? When's the last time you've actually challenged yourself Hey, here's my conviction. Here's the scriptures that support it. Have you ever looked for the scriptures that might not support it? It's a good exercise because on the end of that, you're going to come away knowing more, understanding more, and being more firm in the right conviction, not just the convictions that you want to have. Because otherwise, we're going to end up just preaching what we want. We're going to end up pushing what we want and not actually living the life, not preaching the life or sharing the life that God wants us to live. So we've got to be so careful. So, I guess after all this, after finally being defeated, there's one last person that comes to Jesus and asks him actually what appears to be a very sincere, legitimate question. And when we read this, we'll stumble upon one of the most popular scriptures in the whole Bible, Mark 12, starting in verse 28. It says, One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one answer, Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied, you are right in saying that God is one and that there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all of your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And, and from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Done. No more questions. So there you have it. We, we stumble upon here the two most important commandments out there. The ones that everything hangs on. This is it. This is the epitome of what it means to live the Christian life, to follow Jesus. And it boils down to 
Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It boils down to love. Loving God, loving one another. There's two huge problems with, not this scripture, there's two huge problems with you and I when reading this scripture. First, you have heard it before. And you've heard it a lot before. Over and over and over again, you've heard, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You can, you can recite it. You can write it backwards and upside down and diagonally. You know it. And you've heard it. You've even heard someone preach to you just like this, of how you've heard it so many times. <laughs> but how are you living it? How are you putting it? Here I am again, doing it. How are you living this out? And therein lies the second problem. This concept of doing it and living it out. How in the world do you love anything? How in the world do you love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Wouldn't you think that for the most important commandments that are out there, like this, these are the ones, these are the epitome, this is the everything, wouldn't you really prefer if God just gave you like maybe a really nicely detailed bulleted list of exactly what that is supposed to look like. Maybe like a step-by-step, -step, like number one, you need to go serve the poor this many times at this time during the day. I don't know. That's how I think. I would prefer to have a very, very detailed, exact description of what this love with all of my everything looks like. And we live in a society where we like this. We don't like the gray. We like black and white. I am either doing it or I am not doing it. I have a checkbox. I have a one-size-fits-all. This is how it works. That's what I want. And I would argue that many of you, too, would prefer just the checkbox. If I'm doing it, check, done, moving on, got this, I am full of love, I rock. Okay, moving on. <laughs> but if you notice and you read through the rest of the New Testament, it is filled with commands like this. Super basic, vague commands. <laughs> Love. Serve. Be at peace with. Encourage. Like, what, what do these even mean? What do they look like? How are you supposed to do these things? Well, I think Jesus did that on purpose. I think that he did this on purpose because the reality is different people connect with God in different ways. Different people connect with different people in different ways. And oh, by the way, over time, all those different ways that different people connect with God and different people, over time, changes. So there's no moving target. So love cannot be just a checkbox item. It's a journey. It is something that we're constantly called to wrestle with. To think through. You have not arrived. You have not figured out love. I have not figured out love. We have to constantly fight to figure it out. We have to constantly go after it. I was just in Talkeetna the 10 weeks of my summer in Talkeetna with these HYC and spending most of my time with 16 year old girls and very few 16 year old boys, which is an entirely different lesson. But I had to completely redefine what love looked like because I have no idea how to spend any length of time with a bunch of 16-year-old girls. I don't know how to do that. It's very stressful for me. It's very challenging for me. So I have to redefine what it means to love, redefine what it means to connect. And now, after 10 weeks, I was almost there figuring out how I could connect to these people and help them. And then they left, and now I'm here. And now I have to figure out how to love again, here, with all of you. What does that even mean? I don't know, but are you on the journey? Are you trying to figure it out? Because it's going to change. Love today is not the same as love tomorrow. It's, you have to figure out how different people connect. So how are you connecting with God? How are you going to love him with all of your mind, soul, strength? How are you going on that journey to figure it out, to continue to learn it? That's what the challenge is. And that's the challenge I leave with all of you today. 
figure it out. Figure out what it looks like. I'll bring you back to a question that we asked at the beginning of the summer. What does love require of you? And I'll add to that. What does love require of you now? Because love will not require of you later what it requires of you right now. And it requires you to think about it. It requires you to pray about it. It requires you to put your time, energy, and strength into figuring it out. It's not just a checkbox item. So carry that question around with you this week. Think about what that means. What does love require of you right now? We need to start thinking this way. We need to figure it out. We need to invest the time and energy in figuring out if we're going to be effective for God. If we're going to be able to help people find him. If we're going to be able to serve him in the best way that we can. We've got to figure it out. We've got to go on this journey. So what would happen this week if you really did? If this group of people focus this week on what it means to love right now. Imagine what could happen. Imagine the changes. Imagine how different this city could be next Sunday if all of you take this question, apply it, and love. And love in new ways. Love God in new ways. Connect to people in new ways to help people find him, to help people know him, to improve your relationship with him. It could be amazing. It could be awesome. So let's do that this week. Let's connect with God this week. Let's connect with one another this week. Connect with our neighbors and just see how God can work through all of it to change this city for the better. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, thank you so much for just giving us your word. Lord, that we can be, get into it, that we can be challenged, that we can be motivated, that we can ask big questions like, what does it mean to love? God, thank you for making it vague. Thank you for giving us these big open-ended commandments in so many ways so that way we're forced to think about it so that we can't just turn it into a checkbox item so we can't just turn it into an agenda item that we do when we're done with, Lord. But no, it's that you, that you take us on a journey, that you help us to wrestle, that you help us to fight, that you help us to figure it out, Lord, and that we know that we're in the long haul trying to figure it out with you, God. And we're so grateful that we have you to help us because without that, man, it would be a very, very tough road. And it is a tough road even with you, but we're so grateful for the help that you give us, Lord. Thank you for that, God. And I just pray that you help us connect to this. I, help, I pray that you help us to walk around asking ourselves, what does love require of me now? And how can I love more? How can I connect more? How can I help people find you? How can I help build my relationship with you? How can I build my relationship with the neighbors around me to be able to give you more glory? God, help us to do that. Motivate us to do that. And help us to change the world around us through you and bring you the glory. God, we love you so much. We thank you again for this time. It's in your son's name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this time, we're closing out our service and we're going to take up contribution.